Greetings and welcome to the University of Minnesota Alumni Association's webinar series. Uh, my name is Marissa Smith and I'm the Director of Student and Recent Alumni Engagement and I'm super happy to welcome you all to our webinar today, Creating Inclusion Across Our Organizations. Before I turn it over to our presenter and Fibs, I just have a couple of announcements to make. Um, first, uh, for those of you who have joined us before, you know that our members are the ones that make this series happen. Um, we have been able to do this webinar series for several years now, and it's made possible in part by our members. So if you are a member, thank you. And if you're interested in learning more, you can visit umnalumni.org slash membership. We also wanna do a quick shout out and thank you to our supporting sponsor, Liberty Mutual and uh, share with you a couple of other webinars coming up that might be of interest to you. February is Career Month in the Alumni Association, so we've had a plethora of work workshops, webinars, and events happening around the world, actually. Um, but for those of you who like to tune in virtually for your professional development, on Wednesday, we have a session called Resume Refresh with Tara Dillon over in the Carlson Undergraduate Business Center. And on February 28th in the morning, we're, we're testing out a morning time um, at 8 a.m., uh, we have Discover Your Career Language with Maggie Thomas, also from the Carlson School in the Graduate Business Center. And for February 28th, you have the option to attend virtually or in person. Um, so definitely check out our website for more information about both of those events. And for those of you who have joined us before, you know the, how the technology works. But if you're new, just want to share that you have joined the presentation using your computer speakers by default. If you'd prefer to listen over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane of your GoToWebinar panel and dial-in information will be displayed. And also, if you experience any technical difficulties or issues hearing us, please feel free to reach out via the questions um, tab. But most likely, it's caused by having multiple software applications open or a faulty uh, internet connection. So feel free to go ahead and close any extra uh, windows that you don't need to have open right now um, and maybe connect uh, to a hardwire uh, to listen to today's webinar. Speaking of questions, you can submit them anytime using the questions uh, box on your GoToWebinar panel. We um, will be monitoring them throughout the presentation and may um, answer them as we go. Um, but we also will, uh, our presenter, Anne, has saved a, a good chunk of time at the end to answer questions. So please do submit those as we go. All right. Without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce uh, today's featured speaker, Anne Fibbs. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Anne and then turn it over to her. Anne is the founder and president of Strategic Diversity Initiatives. She brings more than 25 years of experience helping organizations advance their equity, diversity, and inclusion goals. A seasoned consultant, Anne works with small and large organizations on a variety of diversity and inclusion needs, including diversity audits, plans, customized training, and leadership development. She is adept at assessing an organization's strengths and challenges and tailoring her approach to the context, culture, and goals of the organization. With extensive experience in training, teaching, curriculum development, and training of trainers, Anne has delivered hundreds of workshops and classes to thousands of participants in corporate, government, higher education, nonprofit, healthcare, and faith community settings. Anne built a successful diversity and inclusion leadership program at the University of Minnesota, which I was lucky enough to take advantage of and learned a ton. Um, and it has a focus on emotional intelligence and she's an EI practitioner certified in the EQI 2.0 and EQ 360 method. Anne earned her PhD in philosophy and feminist studies from the University of Minnesota, yay. And she now lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Very excited to welcome Anne and we'll turn it over to her now. Hi, um, I am so excited to be here. Thank you, Marissa, for all your help getting this set up. Um, I am a proud alum of the U of M, go Gophers. Also a proud former employee of the Office for Equity and Diversity, first as the G director of the GLBTA programs office uh, for five and a half years, and then moving over to be the first ever director of education in the Office for Equity and Diversity. And that's how Marissa and I got to know each other. Um, I, as she mentioned, I've left to start my own company, Strategic Diversity Initiatives, and I travel around talking about this stuff, and I'm constantly running into folks who are asking me, how can I be a change agent? How can I create inclusion in my workplace? And so that's what we're going to talk about. Here's the agenda. Um, I'm going to start with some framing. So I'm going, I'm going to, to talk at you uh, for a while with this, but um, as Marissa said, I really do hope that you will share questions. 
both as we go along and certainly also at the end so that I can make sure and make this relevant for you. So I'm going to talk about why this matters, the value of diversity. Uh, I have a few slides about how the landscape is changing and how diversity is different from equity. So we want to talk about equity. And we're actually it doesn't say it, but we're going to talk some about pushback uh, around uh, some of these issues around equity. Um, and then I'm going to do a quick review of the some just some concepts that I focused on in my earlier, my other webinar that I did for the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. So we're going to talk about microaggressions, implicit bias, and being an ally, just to be able to talk about how these issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion show up in the workplace. And then I'm going to add in something new, which was something that uh, I used in uh, the leadership program that I started at the uh, with my colleagues at the in the Office for Equity and Diversity. We had a year-long leadership program around diversity and inclusion, and we started it with a focus on emotional intelligence. And the more work I do in this area, the more convinced I am that emotional intelligence is absolutely essential for really being able to be a change agent and to make uh, create an inclusive workplace or a re inclusive space of any kind. So I'm going to share some best practices to wrap up and then leave you with kind of a what if next steps slide um, to move you along in this work because it is lifelong work. It's not work where you say, oh, this will be my year of diversity, my year of inclusion. It needs, I believe it needs to be a lens <clears throat> that we use in, in, in every approach uh, that we use in everything we do, including in our workplace. So let me start with the case for diversity. And I will just say at the outset, I have very wordy slides and some people hate that and have <laughs> let me know in uh, Quick Story of the American Library Association, I read the evaluations and they were like, your slides are too full of words. So, um, but I am a philosopher and I love words. This is a great article by Catherine Phillips in the Scientific American. It says it all right in the title, how diversity makes us smarter. Being around people who are different from us makes us more creative, more diligent, and harder working. And a lot of us do recognize this. We know if you take, for example, a work group and you have a poet and a lawyer and an engineer and a working mom or some, you know, someone who, or a stay-at-home mom who is definitely working, you know, um, those people approach problems differently. Um, and when you put them all in a work group, they're gonna get a better outcome because they see the problem differently. Not as many people realize that while that's true for kind of the, the role you play or how you approach a problem, it's also true for your social identities. Social identities are things like race, ethnicity, nationality, class, sexual orientation, disability, gender, and gender identity. Um, these social identities that impact us, that, that have institutional power at, at play with them, that are related to our laws and practices in, in, in the United States in the world for that matter, but in a US context. And so when we have people with different social identities, we get better outcomes. One example that is in this article is a political science professor who studies how juries function. And he looks at all white juries and racially mixed juries. And he finds that racially mixed juries are more likely to um, ask really great questions, review material in a more in-depth way, and ultimately arrive at better uh, better outcomes. And so reading from the last part of my slide, this is not only because people with different backgrounds bring new information. It's also, it's sim um, sorry, I've got to find it. Uh, simply interacting with individuals who are different forces group members to prepare better, anticipate alternative viewpoints, and to expect that reaching consensus will take effort. That is, when I think you agree with me and we're working on a committee, I might get a little intellectually lazy. But when I feel like you might disagree with me, I'm gonna bring my A game, I'm gonna step it up. And so this is the argument for why we want diversity. And there are many, many more studies uh, that, I, that I won't mention that are in this article. But let me say that um, it's not just enough to have diversity. We can have a very diverse workplace or institution and not necessarily have equity. And so we need to talk about both. I'm gonna jump into some three slides that are going to talk about before I kind of get to a little bit more about equity to talk to continue with this framing. What is the landscape right now? And many people know that the landscape is changing in terms of our demographics around race and ethnicity. So this is from an article, the U.S. will become, quote, minority white in 2045. These are new census population projections. Uh, project that the United States will become minority white or majority people of color in 2045. Um, and 
because minorities or people of color and native folks as a group are younger than whites, for youth under 18, uh, people of color and native folks will outnumber whites next year in 2020. And for those ages 18 to 29, so these are members of the younger labor force, voting age population, I would also say people coming into our institutions of higher education, um, the tipping point's gonna occur in less than 10 years in 2027. I'm going to come back in a minute and talk about the reaction this is creating for people, but this is a big change in our workplaces. There's also a big change with more people uh, who identify as having disabilities coming into the workplace. Here's an article from CNN Business, and they point out that people with disabilities have always been underemployed or unemployed, that the unemployment rate for people with uh, disabilities is significantly higher than people without disabilities. It hovers around 70% last I checked and hasn't significantly shifted since passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA in 1990. But actually we're starting to see uh, more people coming into the workforce who have uh, disabilities and I'd like to say it's because we're doing a good job of reaching out and being inclusive but the fact is it's indicative as this Slide says of the economy reaching full employment, employers reaching out to groups they don't traditionally reach out to. We have a worker shortage, it's pretty significant. And so that means where employers are looking for new pots of new places to, to pull employees and we'll probably are seeing and will continue to see more people with disabilities. I think another thing that's acting on that is the fact that we're pushing on the notion of stigma in particular as it relates to non-apparent disabilities and specifically mental health and mental illness. So the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, says that one in five or 20% of Americans live with a mental health condition, and more and more people are coming out about it. More and more people say, there, this is nothing to be ashamed of. I don't need to feel a stigma. I was thinking about some of the younger entertainers, whether it's the, um, I was just seeing Halsey on Saturday Night Live, and she's open about living with bipolar disorder. Or Pete Davidson, also another SNL reference, who is, uh, actively living with depression and more and more people saying that's not something I want to hide whether it's in the workplace or in other parts of my life and so we see this uh, campaign hashtag cure stigma so that's changing our workplace as well and my last changing landscape slide looks at gender you may or may not know that the entire three states that make up the west coast of the United States Washington Oregon and California now allow people to amend their birth certificates to replace their sex with a non-binary designation. So they no longer say you have to choose male or female. And New York City and New Jersey just passed similar legislation. Uh, in terms of uh, another, another sign of the changing landscape, driver's licenses, Maine, Oregon, California, Washington, the District of Columbia, and here in Minnesota, our state became the last one to allow a third gender option for residents applying for a driver's license. Millennials now make up over a third of the US workforce and the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, GLAAD, estimates as many as 12% of millennials may identify as transgender and non-binary. I was doing a training and I had someone come up to me and share a story. This person works in a relatively large school district. Uh, it's a suburb of the Twin Cities and they allow every student there to take the ACT. But in order to get your results from your ACT, you have to check one of two boxes, male or female. Um, she said to me, do you know what percentage, and this is a large school district, she said, do you know what percentage of our students did not check that box? And I said, no, and she said 30%. 30% of the high school students did not check it. Even though it knew, they knew they would not get their results. And she said, I don't, and I agree with her, I don't think 30% of our students identify as non-binary, but I do think that 30% of our students uh, have a critique of the binary system of gender, probably no kids who are non-binary or transgender and don't wanna participate in it. Well, these folks are coming into our workforce, into our schools, uh, higher education, but I think there's pushback. Uh, and these two studies I'm gonna show uh, kind of point out that not everyone's happy about these changes. So this is an article or rather, excuse me, a study from National Public Radio, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the Harvard School of Public Health from uh, fall of 2017, majority of white Americans say they believe whites face discrimination. So they serve, surveyed over 3,400 uh, American adults, 902 of those were white. 55% of the white respondents say they believe discrimination against white people exists in the US today, but only 19% of the white respondents said that they had been personally discriminated against. So there was a pretty big difference between 
feeling like there's discrimination toward white people and actually feeling like someone didn't give you a job, for example, because you're white. And what that tells me is a per, it's a perception problem. It's an issue. It's a, it's a sense that because we're talking about race, because we're seeing racial changes happening uh, in terms of demographic shifts, more people of color, more people of color in, in leadership positions, native people, et cetera, um, we're seeing white people nervous about it. And we're not just seeing older white Americans. This is a study from January of 2018 where they pulled 15 to 24 year olds and found that 43% of young white men say discrimination against whites is as serious a problem as discrimination against other groups. And 29% of young white women said that. And then 48% of young white men believe efforts to increase diversity will harm white people. So I want that to sink in, that almost half of these young white men believe the things that I do every day that are about talking about race and class and gender and sexual orientation, efforts to increase diversity, to minimize bias, to create inclusion is actually going to harm white people. And that tells me that we need to continue our efforts, at, that it's not enough to just have these demographic shifts or have people of color um, and native folks uh, come into our, uh, all of our, you know, grow in our population. It's not enough to just have more people with disabilities in our workplace. It's not enough to now be more likely to work with someone who's uh, identifies as non-binary or transgender. If what that means is they also face discrimination and bias and people believe that, that those efforts of inclusion are going to hurt them, then we've got pushback and that's a problem. And all that is to say, we need to address equity. We need to talk about these issues. So my last equity slide points out just a few things that are still problematic, uh, that the Southern Poverty Law Center is currently tracking more than 1,600 extremist groups in the country. And one could make an argument that they are feeling particularly emboldened in the last few years. Hate crimes targeting US Muslims rose 15% in 2017, the second year in increases. And of course, we recently saw the horrible uh, attack on the synagogue in Pittsburgh. So uh, it's not only Muslims that face discrimination based on religious identity. Experts are predicting a serious shortage of paid caregivers for people with disabilities and the elderly exacerbated by low wages, high turnover, and challenging working conditions, making it very challenging for people who need to, to not be isolated, to get to their jobs, et cetera. 91% of Fortune 500 CEOs are white men. And in a recent EEO survey, EEOC survey of over 5,200 newly employed workers, black job seekers were offered significantly less compensation than whites by potential new employers. And so, um, that's a perfect example of the difference between diversity and equity. We can have a very diverse workplace, but if we don't offer people the same, and we know this is true around gender as well, uh, then then we're not we're not doesn't matter if you're diverse if you're not equitable. Nobody wants to feel like they're being paid less than someone who's doing the same job. I just saw a quick note, will Anne's slides be available? And they will be. So I know I'm talking fast. I know there are a lot of slides, but this will be archived as well. So you can go back and have access to the slides. Um, more than 200 high powered men have been accused of sexual misconduct. I am sad to say that when I first did this slide in the fall, my number was 100. And so um, we have seen the Me Too movement has, has brought issues of sexual assault, sexual abuse, sexual harassment, very much to the fore. And finally, a leaked Health and Human Service memo plans to shows plans to redefine sex under Title IX, basing it on immutable biological traits identifiable for, by or before birth, and where um, sex listed apologies, uh, sex listed um, on a person's birth certificate as originally issued shall constitute definitive proof of a person's sex unless rebutted by reliable genetic evidence. What does all that mean? That means that I have a friend. Uh, my friend is a transgender woman. Uh, when she was born uh, over 60 years ago, she was assigned male at birth. She had no control over that and never felt like a boy and never felt like a man. Uh, and she is a woman and lives as a woman. But according to this memo, her government is now deciding that uh, her sex her gender identity should be connected to what she was assigned over 60 years ago. And that that original birth certificate, that sex listed on the birth certificate shall constitute definitive proof. So we're in effect starting to have a debate about whether transgender people really exist. Imagine what it's like to, to know that and come into the office one day and feel like 
your government's kind of pushing on that. And it might also be the fact that we're trying to remove transgender uh, service people from the military while we speak. So all of this profoundly affects us. How does it affect us? It affects us just psychically in terms of just carrying kind of the burden of, of oppression and, and stereotypes. And one of the ways it plays out in the workplace is through microaggressions or micro inequities. Sometimes aggression is a hard word for people to hear. They don't feel like a, 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 a seemingly innocent comment is aggressive. So if micro inequities is easier, but I love this website, I highly recommend it. It's not full of statistics and studies and research, it's full of lived experience. And so people write in and share their lived experience with the microaggression and how it made them feel. And uh, if you're interested in some of those, they are on the other uh, webinar that I did. But I just wanna read this, this, this um, description again. Each event, observation, and experience posted is not necessarily particularly striking in and of themselves. Often they're never meant to hurt. These are acts done with little conscious awareness of their meanings and effects. But instead their slow accumulation during a childhood and over a lifetime is in part what defines a marginalized experience, making explanation and communication with someone who does not share this identity particularly difficult. When I do in-person trainings, I offer people an opportunity to share if they've ever experienced or witnessed a microaggression and never force it, but I've had people share amazing experiences, very simple little things that send a message of who belongs where. So for example, an African-American woman who shared that she was waiting in line in first class uh, for, for first class in the air, airport, and a white woman tapped on her shoulder and said to her, this is first class, as if she needed to be reminded, and if, as if she didn't belong there. Or another person who recently shared that when their boss wanted to promote them. He looked at this woman and said, I'm having a hard time. And she said, why? And he goes, well, I always put women into one of two categories, either smart or pretty, and you're both. And so that's making it hard for me to make this decision. And I know it's hard to believe this happens, right? We want to tell ourselves no one would say that anymore. And the fact of the matter is people say those things and much worse all the time. And so this impacts us. And these same stereotypes about who's competent or who's smart or who we should listen to or who should be a leader, they also affect the decisions we make. And we see this in the research on implicit or unconscious bias. This is a uh, definition from the University of Washington uh, on unexamined bias. It's a form of stereotyping that's often unintentional, automatic outside of our awareness. I want to be clear, overt, explicit bias does exist. We know that and it's a problem. Part of why more and more folks are focusing on implicit or unconscious or unexamined bias is because this is the bias we don't even know about. We don't even think we have. Um, framing it specifically as unexamined puts the onus for change on the person who harbors or acts on bias holding them accountable. So the idea is that if I just say, well, everyone has it, we kind of dismiss it and say, oh, it's not a, you know, it's not a, a, a big problem. But in fact, we need to always say everyone shows it and it's a problem. It impacts the decisions we make. A couple of quick references. Uh, many of you may know, or it's very, a lot of folks do know about the Harvard Implicit Association Test or IAT that you can take free of charge. Um, and it uh, allows you to um, see if you show bias. I took it. Uh, I happen to be randomly selected in a workshop to take the one on gender. I'm a I, I studied feminist philosophy. I consider myself a feminist. And sure enough, I showed pro-male and anti-female bias. So we all have it, even those of us uh, uh, with certain identities. And then I highly recommend the Kirwan Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity out of Ohio State. They compile all of the social science data uh, in it done in any given year uh, and put it on their website. So what do we know about the implicit bias very quickly is just as a review, is that people of all racial identities show a pro-white and anti-black bias. People of all gender identities, including women, show a pro-male and anti-female bias. People of all, uh, whatever their explicit view about disability, whether that's they're supportive of people with disabilities, they themselves have a disability, show a negative bias against people with disabilities, and the same is true around sexual orientation. And all of this is to say that it's not a bias towards your own group, it's a bias toward or a positive bias for the group that has social, political, and economic power. And 
And these, these things are impacting the decisions we make in our workplaces. So let's move on to what to do about it, right? We know it's a problem. We know we have this framing. We know the world is changing. Uh, for some people, not fast enough. For others, too fast. We know that um, we are going to see a different kind of workplace. We already are seeing it. So what can we do? This is my definition of being an ally. And some people uh, don't like the word ally. Some people are talking about things like accomplice, co-conspirator. It doesn't really matter to me what the word is. Uh, it could be supporter. It could be anything that works for you. Anything that reminds you that you, whatever your lived experience, whatever your social identity, whatever a level of informal or formal power you do or don't have in any given organization, you can do something about creating more inclusion. So an ally is someone who's willing to pay attention to and take action around the uh, social, economic, and political differences and inequities that attend to people based on distinctions of race, ethnicity, et cetera, social identities. So we know we need to do something. We know it's probably going to be somewhat challenging. Um, we know there's some people who don't want to talk about race in the workplace, who don't want to have a focus on gender and sexual orientation, who don't want to be thinking about non-binary folks. That's why we need emotional intelligence, because, or EQ, as some people call it, e uh, emotional quotient, because this is hard work and this is never just intellectual work. It's always emotional. So here's my intro slide. Um, you can nod to yourself. Have you ever met someone who was interesting but didn't know when to stop talking and never asked you a single question? Worked with someone whose anger was always so close to the surface, you worry they might go off at any minute. Been around someone who seemed to have very low self-esteem such that they never stood up for themselves. Worked with someone who took credit for others' work, never apologized, even when wrong, acted like a bully. Or interacted with someone who made mountains out of molehills, panicked at the slightest problem, or had a negative attitude towards just about everything. My guess is you have worked with someone who's done at least one of those things, if not a number of those things, and it wasn't easy. It isn't at all easy to work with someone who's who's challenged around emotional intelligence. And what I will tell you about emotional intelligence, a little bit of story from my life, is that many years ago in a different setting, uh, I worked with someone who I thought was very, very smart and was a huge ally around social justice, diversity and inclusion. And this person kind of made everyone angry all the time. They, they, they were someone who was very rule bound, very focused on rules. If somebody did something wrong in the workplace, there was never very little compassion or empathy. And it was one of the first times as I watched how this person really struggled with their coworkers, it was one of the first times I realized it's not enough to be right. And it's not enough to be smart. That if you, you can be right and you can be smart. And if you cannot work with people, you won't lead and you won't really be very effective in a lot of what you do. You certainly won't be a change agent and you won't be able to move people on some really challenging issues around equity, diversity, and inclusion. So what is emotional intelligence? Well, it was popularized by Dan Goleman uh, in his 1995 bestseller, Emotional Intelligence. And um, it's really quite simple. Uh, it's recognizing, understanding, and managing our own emotions. And when I train this, I always say, that always sounds so easy, doesn't it? <laughs> um, and it's recognizing, understanding, and influencing, not to be confused with um, manipulating, but influencing the emotion of others. And so I have two diagrams that show, this is the one I call the noun diagram. It's a, obviously there's a brain in the middle and the top three circles talk about how we understand ourselves. So self-awareness, which seems very simple, right? How, how is it where everybody should be self-aware? But if you've ever been in a meeting where you started getting more and more resentful, uh, but you didn't know it, and you come out of the meeting and your colleague goes, whoa, man, you, you, are, you could just feel the resentment. You're like, what? What are you talking about? I'm not resentful, right? Or anger. You know, sometimes we're not aware when, when we're feeling things. So self-awareness becomes very important. Also then self-regulation. I can't regulate if I don't know what I'm feeling. So from self-awareness comes this sense that now, okay, now I know I'm going to be angry when I go in that meeting. I better figure out how to contain it because my boss is in that meeting. And then how do I motivate myself? And the bottom two slides are about how we interact with other people. So um, uh, empathy, obviously, do we have compassion and can we, can we feel, as Brene Brown uh, talks about in this one video clip, can we feel with people, not necessarily for them, but with, with them uh, when they're feeling bad or whatever they're feeling? And also, do we have social skills to be able to work with people? 
And here is a similar, this is the one I call the verbs. So uh, again, the circles and the different domains, you have to know your emotions and manage your emotions and motivate yourself. And then you need to be able to recognize and know others' emotions and manage the emotions of others. So for example, I come into the meeting and I know that there's someone in there who doesn't wanna be in this meeting, who doesn't think they need to be in this meeting. Um, and if I'm not careful, this person's gonna derail my meeting. If I can know that that's gonna happen because it's happened before, I'm recognizing their emotions. I know I'm already annoyed about it, so I need to tamp down my annoyance so I can be effective. And now I gotta figure out, maybe the first thing I do is I come in and I say, hey, Ann, you know what? I want you. I want to. I want. I want to see. Uh, I want to know what you're thinking right now because I really want to get you involved. I don't know. I don't know what the best way to do that would be, but it might be to to kind of hit the nail on the head and go right into it. But at any rate, what you're doing is you're being proactive. You're not letting the emotions run the meeting so much as being prepared to let those uh, to to be aware of the emotions so you can use them. This is a model that I was trained in, and I'll just put it up to point out that it, you can go really in depth with these notions of self-perception, self-expression, interpersonal decision-making, and stress management. And some of those are just so critically important if you think about working on a team, decision-making, problem-solving, reality testing, impulse control. You can't work well with someone who is so impulsive or stress management. There isn't a workplace that doesn't need people to be flexible, to have stress tolerance, or to be optimistic. So what's the connection with diversity and inclusion? So acting as an ally and creating inclusion can be challenging, and really it will be challenging. And so it requires optimism, stress tolerance, self-regard, strong interpersonal relationships, and flexibility, which are key emotional intelligence traits. When you decide to go to that, um, for the first time to that diversity climate summit, and you raise your hand and you say something and somebody turns around and without being very kind, because not everyone ever has to be kind, says to you, I can't believe you just said that. I can tell you're really new to this. You know, maybe, maybe you should have listened more instead of making a comment. You're going to be really tempted to flee that summit and to never do the work. And so you're going to need self-regard to hold on to yourself. You're going to need strong interpersonal relationships. Maybe you'll be really brave and walk up to that person afterward and said, and say, wow, that was really hard to hear you say that, but it's you really got me thinking, right? Um, that's leadership. We can't build effective work relationships and be an inclusive ally unless we understand and value our own emotions, allowing us to understand and value others' emotions. I have seen things blow up in the setting of diversity, equity, inclusion far too often where people are feeling a lot of very intense things because this work is, we're talking about trauma, we're talking about hurt, we're talking about oppression. These are not things that live above our neck. These are things that are that are embodied. They, they affect our soul, our, uh, our, our emotions, our well-being, and there's a lot of emotion attached. And so being able to kind of manage that is gonna be really important. So to, by developing our emotional intelligence, we de develop as an inclusive ally. Um, these are some, I've got four slides that just point out some best practices, how I think we really can go about creating inclusion. And I think you'll see that, that, that the need for emotional intelligence and really being really carrying these out. So we start with the need to continue your own education. And that's part of the idea that this is lifelong work, that anyone who goes into being a, a change agent, an ally, whatever word you use, someone who really cares about inclusion, if you go in there thinking you know it all, thinking you're more woke than anyone else um, or everyone else in particular um, might come back on you much quicker than you think. So coming in uh, with humility is, is huge, terribly important in this work. So continue your own education. Know what topics or issues around diversity, equity, and inclusion are most familiar and comfortable and know where you need to do more work. Pay attention to what might make you nervous or uncomfortable. And if you say, wow, you know, nothing makes me nervous, you might want to kind of check that out a little bit. Um, no one knows everything about these topics, and we all have work to do. Being an inclusive ally requires self-awareness, continuous learning, and a willingness to admit when we've made a mistake. That is a huge problem in the workplace in general, in human relationships. It's certainly a huge problem in our political and social life right now, this unwillingness to admit when we've made a mistake. Um, and so we need to be able to do that. And if you look at as a, as a kind of microcosm or um, 
a case study, look at what's going on in the state of Virginia right now with the leadership and watching um, a, a white man uh, uh, who uh, has tremendous issues around racial equity and around um, these very offensive, this very offensive photo in his medical school, school yearbook, the current governor, um, you're watching a white man talk about race when it's pretty obvious that he's never really been taught to do that. And I say that as a white person raised in the United States who was raised by liberal parents, but also was never taught to talk about race, never, never uh, learned or didn't learn early on how to have these sometimes very uncomfortable conversations. And so that's a disservice we do. Um, obviously to people of color and to native folks who are living with racism, absolutely. And it's a disservice to our entire country that we don't teach people that we are gonna make mistakes because of our history of racism or because of our history of misogyny, et cetera. Um, get involved and know it's okay to feel vulnerable. And a, a lot of the work I'm doing now uh, as I talk about this, these issues with people is to talk about shifting vulnerability that we are comfortable, and I say we, meaning most Americans, uh, I believe we are comfortable with um, women being vulnerable and talking about gender violence and sexual harassment. I think we are comfortable in having people of color and native folks talk about the effects of racism. I think we are comfortable uh, having trans folks and LGBTQIA folks talk about sexual orientation, gender identity, people with disabilities talk about their experiences. But when we flip that and we ask white people to talk about race, uh, if many of you, probably, some of you may know about the book that's gotten a lot, it's now a New York Times bestseller, Rama D'Angelo, White Fragility, talking about why it's so challenging for white people to, uh, to talk about this. Look at what's going on with the Me Too movement. You literally have corporate executives now saying things like, I'm so confused about what to do uh, that I will not have a woman in my office and close the door. And it's just that kind of inability to be vulnerable that is hurting everyone, including, think about how that hurts the women. So you're telling me now, sir, that your female employees don't get the benefit of a private conversation with their boss because you're not quite sure how to act, or you're nervous that you might be perceived as, as being a sexual harasser. And so, so you got men feeling vulnerable about this. And instead of saying, hmm, what do I need to learn here? Or white people, what do I need to learn about racism? What's going on? Look at what's happening to the state of Virginia. Boy, look at how do we need to address our history in ways we've never done that? Instead, we find ways to push it aside. So being so a huge piece of emotional intelligence in this work is how can I be vulnerable and still hold on to myself and not fall apart? So find out what exists in your workplace or organization around issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Is there a lunch and learn you can attend, a book club? Is there a diversity committee you can join or start? And if you are, if you are watching this and say, there is nothing going on in my workplace or organization, then I would say, what will you start? How can you begin the conversation? And here's the kicker. You don't have to be someone with a marginalized identity. You don't have to be someone with a lot of positional power. Um, you can be new to the organization. You can be someone that you think doesn't have a lot of formal power. You can be a white, heterosexual, cisgender, middle-class, able-bodied man. There's a lot of privilege in those identities who says, I don't, I don't wanna be about exclusion. I wanna do the right thing. Get out of your comfort zone. Show up at a, to a Black History Month event or an LGBTQ plus program, even if you're not a member of those identities and communities. And if you worry that when you walk in, you won't be welcome, or you don't know if you belong, then you are starting to feel the experiences that marginalized people feel every day. And so starting to shift again, that vulnerability. Um, I can't tell you how many women's conferences I've been at where there are no men, LGBTQ programs where the vast majority of people are themselves in the LGBTQ community, uh, events for African-Americans, uh, for example, a Black History Month event and there's very few people who are not African-American and especially very few white people. That needs to shift. That really needs to shift. Think about those spaces and places you inhabit. What message do they send about your commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion? Um, appreciate what your colleagues are going through. Be caring and compassionate toward them. 
This will be particularly important for your colleagues with marginalized identities, people of color, American Indians, LGBTQ plus folks, those who identify as Muslim, people with disabilities, et cetera. Don't assume you know how easy or how hard their life is, but ask how they're doing and leave room for the, them to honestly answer. Offer support and be okay if they don't take you up on it. And this is again, the vulnerability. We don't wanna do anything until we know we've got it perfect and we know someone will like what we do. And that isn't gonna happen. You might say to someone, hey, you know, I, 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 I'm I, just wondering, you know, I just saw this new policy that came out around the trans inclusion, or I just saw another thing going on around race, and I just wanted to check in. And someone might look at you and go, I'm fine, and walk away. And then you need to figure out how to be fine yourself and not follow them around to get them to make sure that you're okay, right? Um, you could always, if you're white, you could go to another white person to talk to. You don't have to get support from someone with a marginalized identity, but um, let them know, your colleagues know, you are always available to listen, even if they have challenges and problems you cannot fix. Why did I put that in there? Because part of what happens sometimes, particularly when we're new to this, is we hear about something, and then especially if we're an ally and, and we, we have a privileged identity, we say, oh, oh my, are you kidding me? There's racism? We have to fix it. Oh my goodness, you mean, you mean there are men who are not listening to the women? Uh, I'll tell a quick story. I have a wonderful colleague who's a CEO and he's on a learning journey around gender. And he said that he was in a room with a whole bunch of other CEOs and he was floored by how many of the men talked over the female CEOs in the room. So he went to the one of the CEOs and he goes, I, oh my gosh, those guys just all talk, talked over you. And she looked right at him and said, uh, yes, <laughs> like, welcome to my life. And he said it was very interesting that to notice how much he hadn't noticed it, that it's literally like a lens, that it's like a muscle that you can exercise that will get stronger, a lens you can use. And you, when you have privilege, it's a lens you can take on and off. Um, finally, be brave and take risks. Be the first person to raise an issue, ask a question and or confront bias. And if you think for one minute that every person in the room is gonna love you for doing it, I will tell you right now, they won't. If we could have ended racism by people being kind and polite and respectful, um, I've just described many workplaces in the United States, we'd have ended racism. We'd have ended sexism and misogyny if all we needed was men to be good, kind people. Um, these, uh, this, kind of oppression is entrenched. It's built into our very institutions. And so you need to be the person who says, can, can we just slow down a minute? I just wanna point out that, um, that we, you know, there are a few voices that are not coming out in this meeting or can we, I wanna ask some questions about some things I think we're missing. So if you can't be the first person, make sure you add your voice when you're able. Model for others how someone can always promote diversity, equity, and inclusion whatever their role, their social identity, their lived experience, and even if it feels uncomfortable. So the goal is not to only do this when it feels good, when it feels easy, or when it feels comfortable. It often will, will feel none of those things. Um, know that diversity, equity, and inclusion work is often messy, complex, and challenging. It's really not a case of if, it's really a case of when. Don't stop when it gets difficult because not everyone can. What, is I, what do I mean by that? You know you have privilege when you start talking about race as a white person and it gets complicated and messy and suddenly people are frustrated and angry and, you, and you're not sure which, which way is up or down and then you decide, oh, I can't do this. Um, that's when you know you have privilege because people of color and native folks can't walk away from that. I, as someone who identifies as lesbian or queer, uh, those identities follow me into every space I'm in. And so I don't really walk away from it or go away from it. Um, and so, so a big piece of being a change agent, change agent and an ally is staying in it, even if you're not certain, even if you're nervous, even if it feels challenging. And so I'll leave you with this slide and then we can take some questions. Just some takeaways. What if you acted as if, as if every kind of person with every social identity? So someone who's non-binary, someone who lives with a mental illness or a mental health condition, someone who identifies as Native American, someone who uh, is Muslim, someone who grew up poor, someone who is currently living in poverty, someone who's um, a woman, inhabited every space you're in, your workplace, your neighborhood, your group of friends, your family, your faith community, 
How might you feel? What might you think? And how might you act? Um, I, I once had a colleague who was sitting with her boyfriend watching at a bar and they happened to be watching the um, men's figure skating in the Olympics. And another man who uh, apparently was trying to bond with her over homophobia turned to her and made a homophobic comment about male figure skaters. And what I love about the story is that she, she, didn't, she didn't turn away. She turned to him and she confronted him and said, I don't think there's anything about male figure skaters being gay that's bad. And so suddenly it wasn't just someone he identified as possibly in the community, but someone he identified as straight who said, that's not okay. And so um, we're seeing this kind of movement. If you haven't, if you haven't seen, it's got controversial because of course these things are controversial. I just put those in air quotes, but if you haven't seen the Gillette commercial um, that they made about toxic masculinity, masculinity, I highly recommend it. It's an example of how we start to say what happens when those people we don't expect to speak up, when men start saying, I don't want you to treat women like that, or boys start saying, don't treat girls like that. Um, and then finally, your next steps for developing as an ally, what can you commit to do in one week? What can you commit to do in the coming year? And perhaps the most important question I could ask you in this whole hour long session, how can you hold yourself accountable? Because again, I will remind you when it gets challenging, not if, but when it gets hard, when it gets confusing, when it gets scary and disconcerting, and when you start to go up against people you care deeply about, when you are really in conflict with an uncle or a mother or a child uh, or a best friend, and that might happen, how will you hold on to yourself? That's the emotional intelligence. So I'm not saying you have to do away with those relationships, but being able to uh, hold on to yourself and say, I still can be committed to equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, becomes really important. So, um, so I'm going to start answering some of the questions. Um, uh, definition of an ally, does that assume that an ally is a person who is not discriminated against, a white person? Well, I mean, I think... I would see it as an ally is someone, yeah, who doesn't have that particular identity. Now, I'll give you an example. I identify as lesbian. I work hard to be an ally to people within my own community. So while we're all queer, I think there's biphobia and transphobia in the queer community. So I work to be an ally to bi folks and to trans folks. Um, but I but I do typically think of, of ally and a lot of people are starting to talk about allyship as well, the notion that it can't just be a noun, like an identity, like I'm an ally, but more, it really needs to be active. So rather than, yeah, that notion of it being an identity as it being behavior, um, which is really, uh, I think, similar to what I've been saying, which is you have to be doing it for it to count. It doesn't work to just say, yeah, I'm woke. I, I don't think of people this way. It doesn't work that way. You need to be bringing it up uh, as much as possible. And that doesn't mean, let me be clear, that doesn't mean you, you make your boss angry every time she's in the room, you bring something up and pretty soon you're worried you're gonna lose your job. We, you get to do this in a way that is, um, I, I've, I've had people tell me really horrific stories of incredible um, bias on the part of supervisors. And that puts people in very challenging positions. So I would never say to someone, you have to challenge your supervisor and risk being unemployed, being fired, uh, being laid off. Uh, of course not. Um, but at the same time, while that does happen, all too often, we wouldn't be taking that big a risk. We just don't want to make anyone uncomfortable. Um, OK, great to hear your thoughts on psychological safety. Can we pull that one up yeah. a little bit? Thank you. Um, it's right here. Oh, hi. When you cover emotional intelligence, it would be also great to hear your thoughts on psychological safety. That's a great question. One of the things I say is I never guarantee safety for anyone about anything, including when I do my training. So I think safety is a very loaded word. I think we want to try to keep people as safe as possible. But the fact of the matter is I may say something or do something that makes someone feel unsafe that's connected to a past experience. Um, and so uh, an example, too, is I, I, I have seen experiences where there was anger in the workplace that was automatically seen as unsafe and it's 
it was it can often be seen as unsafe when it's on the part of people of color or native folks when it, and different when it's on the part of white people um, and so suddenly you've got that component in it um, which is not to say that that anger doesn't sometimes make some people feel unsafe I don't think it's automatically necessarily hostile or toxic but if I can get to that the other point as well is I think this was similar to what I was saying I I would never uh, expect anyone to put themselves in a position that for them is unsafe in order to be a change agent. So I had a friend once who saw a group of um, white male police officers, four of them, at a coffee shop and they were kind of telling sexist jokes. And my friend who identified as a white man went up and confronted them. I don't know that much came of it and good for him. I'm not sure I would have done that. Um, I'm white, I'm also female, and um, I just don't know if I would have done that. I certainly could understand if people of color and native folks wouldn't have wanted to do that. Um, so I, that becomes really important that people keep themselves safe as much as possible. At the same time, so I'm, I wanna push on the notion, the difference between safety and comfort. Um, I, I would not advocate a lack of safety. I, I would advocate sometimes a lack of comfort. Um, do you have suggestions on how to oops, sorry, exactly. implement uh, inclusion equity in a college classroom? What are some small and big steps we can make that challenge your students? Oh, yes, um, it's uh, great. I have a lot of ideas. Um, first and foremost, be open about your commitment to it. Um, put it in your syllabus. Uh, put on your syllabus references to whatever's on in your campus around um, disability, you know, if you were at the U of M, it would be the offices and office for equity and diversity, the Queer Student Cultural Center, the American Indian Student Cultural Center. Um, let people know that you care about this. Let people know that you're on a journey like they are, that, you, that, that you're, you're comfortable if they kind of call you into a conversation and you want to call them into a conversation. Um, this gets at safety. Sometimes people worry that in a something like a classroom, there might be a lot of yelling. And I think you could say there might be really big feelings. And why wouldn't you have big feelings about race? We should have big, deep feelings. This is, our racist past is horrific. It's heart-wrenching. And it's not our racist past, it's our racist, racist present. Our, our, our treatment of women and girls is horrific. Uh, the, the number of trans women, and especially trans women of color, are murdered should make us sob, right? So we have big feelings, but the faculty member, the instructor's job is to hold that. And if someone does fall apart, say, I'm sorry, you're having a hard time. You know, you might want to leave the room and take care of yourself and come back. And if someone gets so angry that they're starting to get toxic, you manage that. But what we don't do is shy away from the conversation, which is what we do as a country all the time. Um, let's see, where do you, where do you do, uh, Sorry, okay, hold on. How do you handle employees, sorry, okay. Employee resource groups that are labeled specifically gender identity, oh, women in technology. It is a concern that it's not inclusive and non binary folks. That's a great question. I did some work recently with the College of St. Catharines, which is a historically, uh, at least their undergraduate college has historically been for women. Um, and they now they've changed their policy. They're welcome to people of all gender identities, but they wanted to keep some language um, around the, the history of them being a kind of a women's college. Um, I think how do you handle employee resource groups? You talk to them about it. Um, one thing might be, could they, would they want to keep the name women in technology and talk about um, or change it to something like gender and technology and, and create a more welcoming mission statement that talks about understanding how gender bias and sexism has influenced technology. One of the things I think that's important to hold on to is why we have things that are that are women that we that we want to embrace. Um, we want to push on the binary without minimizing the fact that that binary has created a tremendous amount of sexism toward people who identify as female or women. And by that, I mean anyone who identifies as female or woman, right? So the so things that are associated with the feminine, um, are, you know, the fact that uh, when veterinary science was male dominated, 
people made more money. As soon as a, we know, as soon as a occupation becomes female dominated like veterinary science, mm -hmm. the, the um, salaries go down. So we want to be able to talk about how sexism plays out in the context of challenging the gender binary. And that is difficult and it's challenging and it's going to require some talking. Um, but, but I think being a change agent would be to go to those folks and rather than just sending an email, and this is emotional intelligence. I'm not saying whoever wrote that question did this, but let's say somebody started writing these emails. Why are you, why are you a women's group? Don't you know the gender binary? That's no emotional intelligence. The emotional intelligence is they're trying to do something good because I don't think it's actually easy to be a woman in technology, right? So how can I support them and do some education around the, the, the gender, challenging the gender binary? Um, what are uh, white men in positions, sorry, uh, what are your recommendations for white men in positions of power for being able to speak up and be an ally without unintentionally giving off a sense of trying to mansplain? Um, well, first off, um, don't talk too much. Um, be humble about it and say things like, I'm working really hard not to mansplain. <laughs> um, be, I mean, I, I, I like a direct approach. I mean, I think, I think um, if you see your female colleagues or non-binary colleagues speaking up, don't speak up over them. Don't, you know, kind of the obviously low hanging fruit. Don't, don't, don't do that stuff. But if no one else is saying anything, I think there are ways to bring things up that are not mansplaining. I do not think every time a white person brings up or challenges racism, that is automatically white splaining. I don't believe that. White splaining is when I do it, A, to a person of color or a native person, or B, when I try to do it in a way that minimizes their experience. But sometimes you are going to be, um, there aren't going to be people of color or native folks in the room. There aren't going to be LGBTQ folks in the room. There aren't going to be Muslim or non-Christian folks in the room. There aren't going to be anybody who's not male in the room. Somebody needs to be speaking up. Um, and so I, I think there are ways, I think just being really attentive to how you talk. Um, I think that's where we're going. Oh, we're almost done. Yeah. Sure. I know. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> that's a really great question. Yeah, it's wonderful, thoughtful questions that were sparked by a wonderful, thoughtful presentation. Thank you, Anne. I really appreciated and always appreciate how you weave research and current events and stories into really practical things that we can take into our, our different communities. And I know that, again, I learned I learned a lot. So I scribbled down a bunch of notes myself. Um, wanna make sure that we're, we have a chance to put up your contact information in case folks wanna reach out. You do consulting and training and um, are available to go out into workspaces. So if, if you're um, listening to uh, this presentation and you want to partner with Anna on something moving forward, here is her contact information. Um, and highly encourage you to reach out. I um, want to close by just again thanking our partners that made today's webinar possible and hope you will join us again for webinars in the future. Have a great afternoon.